Tonight on the fifth chapter, in the wake of the death of George Floyd, massive protests and riots erupt across the country. What do Dennis and Brian think about the story that has surpassed the coronavirus pandemic as the number one story in America today? The Major League Baseball players make an offer to the owners. Are the two sides making progress or wasting everyone's time? And Governor Whitmer liberates the state of Michigan 11 days early. But when bars and restaurants reopen, will Dennis and Brian rush to dine out? Join the conversation by sending your tweets to at Dennis Fithian and at D Chap Force. This is the fifth chapter with Dennis Fithian and Brian Chapman. He represents the myth by way of Penn State. When Chapman gets to talk in sports, but people can't wait. He represents the myth. Be a true EMU, but cut Dennis in the fall. And his veins bleeding blue, they got respect around the state. When that light turns red, so don't sleep on these dudes. Just invite your friends to cut your natural and tip your cap for and sit back for the fifth chapter. Huh. Brian Chapman. Dennis Fithian. When they open their mouths, they spit in the facts, bruh. This ain't even optional, man. You just have to tune into YouTube to watch the broadcast or download it to your phone to peep the podcast. They mix laughter, they get after. It's all captured in the fifth chapter. Huh. Huh. That's right, and welcome to the fifth chapter. I am Brian Chapman. He is Dennis Fifty. Thank you guys for tuning in to episode number seven. How's it going, Dennis? Going pretty good, Jeff. Good to see you. That's right. Thank you to everyone who's watching on YouTube or listening to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or Spotify. Make sure that you like, subscribe, and participate in each show by sending your tweets to at Dennis Fifty or at the Jeff Sports or by commenting during the live stream right here on the side. Now let's take a look at today's book. And as you can see, in the second chapter, there's been a lot of looting, protesting, and rioting. We'll tell you where we stand and what's been taking place in the next week and where we go from here. In the third chapter, we've got more updates on the Major League Baseball Players Association and the players trying to come to some sort of an agreement to start the season in the in the early part of july in the fourth chapter it's trivia time two weeks ago i was five for five will dennis challenge me more today and in the fifth chapter governor whitmer finally liberates michigan she does it 11 days early and we'll be able to go to bars and restaurants beginning monday june 8th how quickly will dennis and i choose to partake in going to a bar but dennis we'll start off with the first chapter and uh for anyone that just saw the book right there saw the table of contents for today's show it's a, a much different show than a lot of our shows have been uh, a, a lot less sports today and that's because the biggest story in the country has shifted from the coronavirus pandemic to the death of george floyd at the hands of minneapolis police officers and the nationwide reaction to it in in the last week we've seen peaceful protests We've seen rioting, we've seen looting, and we'll get to that in the second chapter. And we've also seen a CNN crew get arrested on live TV. We've seen athletes react. We've seen sports leagues react. And then yesterday, we saw President Trump react. And, and this was after um, spending most of the weekend not reacting, but he did react by going to the White House lawn and giving a brief address in which he said that if there wasn't the appropriate response to crack down and dominate on the looters and the, and the rioters and the protesters that he would send in the military to various states. And then afterwards, a very troubling scene took place. There were, according to multiple reports, peaceful protesters outside the White House a half hour before the curfew took place who were uh, rushed by law enforcement officials Secret Service, I, I believe members of the army, they deployed tear gas and flashbangs on the peaceful protesters before the curfew started to clear the way for President Trump to walk, to walk across the street, to walk across the street to a church just so that the nation could witness this.
hate my life. It looked like it was just a publicity stunt. It looked like it was just a photo shoot. And church leaders from across the country slammed the president for doing that yesterday. Uh, Dennis, when it comes to that, when it comes to everything that's taken place over the last week in response to the death of George Floyd, what, what comes to mind for you? Well, a million things. That wasn't uh, Donald Trump's finest moment, that's for sure. I would like to say I appreciate everybody already getting in, uh, like Reno and Jacob and James, on the, uh, the the live feed. We'll be reading those throughout the show, so uh, we do appreciate that. Yeah, the one thing, like, uh, we don't know if we're in the middle of this, we're towards the end, or if this is just beginning here. It's just one of these things, like, uh, you know, this is, uh, the, as it's going on, real time, as we're talking about all of this, it was, um, you know, just yesterday, uh, a week ago, that, we uh, that 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 when you know George Floyd was was pinned down by that police officer and you know for me it's one of these things where I have not been watching uh, cable news local news I haven't been watching TV I've really been uh, you know just taking a step back from from almost uh, all media uh, picking and choosing here and there so I didn't really even skip this story till about Wednesday or Thursday. And, you know, there was a point where I got into the weekend, chap, where uh, I, I knew everybody was hurting. I knew, uh, you know, and everybody across this country, you know, black America was, was, was sad and angry. And I get that. And I was having empathy uh, for them, thinking about, uh, you know, the situation. And then it came Saturday where it was like people were, were questioning the videos and like, hey, who are these people that are, are rioting? Who are these people that are looting? Who are these people that are protesting? And for... You know, really, for a couple minutes, I was sitting back and I was like, "What? What's going on here? I, like, is this some kind of planned attack from from other groups that are loosely organized? All of that." So it, this has been, uh, you know, it's, this has been a, a difficult part to to sift through and trying to figure out, like, okay, who's really out here and protesting, and really what's going on. But really, when it comes back to the bottom line here, is that this is something that we have seen uh, over the last couple of years. And it, it feels like, and I, I understand why people are, are angry, is that we've had these situations before, whether it was in Ferguson, Missouri, or whether it was in New York back in 2014. And we talk about it for a couple of days. We might talk about it for a week. We might even talk about it for a month with, with protest. And then it kind of seems like people get tired of talking about it, and it kind of goes by the wayside. Yeah, and I think that a lot of people are trying to make sure that this time that's not the case where this time it's not just, hey, an unarmed black man got killed and uh, we'll just, we'll let the people vent for a little bit. We'll let them uh, loot a little bit. We'll let them protest and then they'll they'll find something else better to do. And then once that goes away, we can let the cops off and then we can go back to normal. I think that this time people are saying that enough is enough. You can't just go around killing an unarmed black man. And if you are a policeman who is, who was not doing the killing, you can't just stand around and watch that. I knew that there was gonna be people saying he should have been obeying the law, he should have stopped uh, resisting arrest, and I bet he has a criminal record, and it turns out that he wasn't uh, resisting arrest, it turned out that he was obeying the law, it turned out that he did not have, at least as far as I know, uh, a criminal record, and then suddenly we see these protests happen, and honestly, when, when I first saw that George Floyd died, um, I, didn't, I wouldn't say I had an identical reaction, but it was similar because I heard about it and I just kind of shook my head because I was thinking, you know, here we go again. Another unarmed black man is, is going to die and nothing is going to happen about it or nothing is going to happen. And then the protests happened and they were monster protests in Minneapolis. And then they spread from Minneapolis within a couple of days to across the country. And now I'm seeing that it's going across the world to Europe and other places. I, I mean... I think that folks are finally starting to get it. I think that not only are they seeing the rioting, and I hate the rioting with a passion, but I think that because we're seeing that it's so widespread, because we're seeing that it's not just black people, and at a lot of these protests, it's not even majority black people, that perhaps this time things are going to change. Yeah, I think the one thing that, and it reminded me a little bit uh, of sports, where for, for years we would hear about, well, this person uh, was involved in domestic violence, and then, you know, you'd, you'd sift through the, 
you know, the statements and, and what was being said. And you're like, well, you know, one side saying this, this looks like it could be a he said, she said thing. And, and then you wouldn't really get anywhere with it. It's like, yeah, you know, domestic violence is terrible. But then we had some situations where you think about Ray Rice. We had a video and we were able to look at it. And then we knew, we knew what we saw there. That was domestic violence. And with this case here, you can't even think of anything where you need to have a a suspect with, uh, you know, being driven down or having the knee in the on a guy's neck. I mean, we have the whole video there and we have the police officers that are standing next to him. And it's just, uh, it's one of these things, once you watch it, you know that that's going to stay with you for the rest of your life. So this is one of these things uh, we, we've had these situations before, like, okay, this is what was being said, or, you know, this video came in at the end. This is the video. We see it here. And, you know, this is one of the reasons was you're saying this is going to stick and people are not, uh, we, we've got a, a situation here with, with COVID where, you know, there's, there's, there's nothing else really going on in the world. We have our attention on this. Mm-hmm. Well, it's and, also you know, been, that's one of the things. It's also been in rapid succession multiple incidents of 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 cover-ups or attacks on on the black community because you look at this, you look at Ahmad Arbery where he was killed what weeks or months ago and you got video that finally comes out after like two or three prosecutors get on the case, they finally decide to charge somebody and then when you see the video when it finally comes out it was it was edited to take out the part when he actually got shot and then you think about the situation that happened in central park in new york city where this uh this white woman was walking her dog in the park and the dog was not on a leash and that's against central park rules and so a black man who was watching birds like you can't be tamer than that you can't be tamer than a bird watcher and i've never heard of a black bird watcher but he was watching birds and he wanted the woman to put the dog on a leash because A, that's the park rule, and B, dogs that are running around can scare the birds away. And she had the nerve to act all hysterical and say, you're being aggressive. I'm going to call the cops and not just call the cops, but tell them that I'm being harassed and intimidated by an African-American. I mean, to, 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 to do that when A, you know it's not true, but B, to say that and say, hey, I'm a white woman who is being intimidated by an African-American, she assumes that by saying those key words, the police are gonna drop everything they're doing and charge out there and say, we've gotta save this, this, uh, this damsel in distress, this white damsel in distress from this monster black man. And it was all on video, she knew it was all on video, and she got fired, which is a good thing. But people see all this stuff like, wait a second, we got to make sure this stuff gets nipped in the bud and we're sick and tired of it. Yeah, the part about uh, the last part there is how do you start nipping this in the bud? How do you start uh, moving forward? How can you get uh, we talk about, well, you know, get training with police like, look, you know what? Uh, we need police officers. We don't need to target police officers. We need to work together. Yeah, with the attacks on the police. police the last few days have not been um, my favorite no, thing to watch at all. That's not the answer. So we're, we're trying to figure out this is not something easy where we just say, yes, stop harassing black people. But, you know, there's the one part where it does feel like this is a, a cycle. And, and that's the situation where we've seen it so many other times. And that's why this is, you know, bubbled over. And, I, and my, you know, my judgment here, this situation is that, you know, I was I've taken calls in Southeast Michigan from just uh, random listeners for over 20 years. And when situations like this come up, you know, there will be people that will call in and talk about their own situations. And you have these situations where, you know, people are scared. If you're a black male and you're driving uh, anywhere in the United States, you're scared when the police lights come on and you get pulled over. That can't be a situation That, that that's not, the kind of a, a America we want to live in where we have a, a, a citizen who is getting pulled over and he's fearful of his life or, you know, the kid's life, but we have seen their kids and their children, but we've seen this so many times uh, trying to take steps to uh, the, the, where do you start, you know, to uh, you, you start with police training, you start with really, uh, you know, with, with community and you really, you need to stay on this where it doesn't just become, uh, it's put in the rearview mirror by next week where, okay, the, the riots have settled down. Uh, let's move on to the next thing and let, let's kind yeah, of put people this. People want action. And when it comes to action, 
Um, I, I, what have we seen so far since the death of George Lloyd? We've seen what a new prosecutor or like the, the state take over the case. And we've seen one of the four officers get charged. People say we want justice. What about the other three? That would be a, a good first step to getting justice. And number two would be some meaningful systemic police brutality and police accountability laws that are put on the books so that this stuff doesn't happen again. Because my, my first thought was that this is just going to get swept under the rug and, you know, his buddies in the police department, his buddies that are in, in, in charge of the review are going to say, hey, you know, he got fired. This is not how we would like things to be done. And that's that. And the reason I thought that was because of what happened in other cases, like, for instance, Eric Garner in New York. If we have some laws being passed in D.C., to reform things. If we have laws being passed in state capitals across the country for police accountability and police brutality reform, we'll, ha we'll perhaps see the justice and the change that people want. But so far, we've gotten one thing in terms of accountability, and that's one of the four officers being charged. That's not good enough so far. Yeah, I would agree. You know, you would think, I remember going through both the, uh, the Gardner situation, it was Brown and, and Ferguson, Missouri, as well, Michael Brown, I think the guy's name was. And you go through the, uh, you know, everything that we know and you think, OK, well, this this definitely seems like there's enough where, you know, these that there's going to be some charges brought forth and this mm -hmm. is they're going to get their day in court. And then it gets to that point and It's like, no, we're moving on. There wasn't enough here. And you just thinking, well, I don't. It, 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 that's the separation. Like, you and don't what get about that part. in Louisville just what a week or so ago? A guy gets shot, and then they find out, and I think he got killed, and they found out that all the Louisville Police Department officers had their body cameras off. Yeah. Like we we were talking about this. I think I did shows with you when we were talking about the need for body cameras. What's the point of having them if they're not going to be turned on? They should be on at all times. And the last time you want to turn them off is when you're about to engage with a suspect. But but, you know, I, I started off this this segment by also playing the video of the president. And the, I, I thought it was important to put that in there for a couple of reasons. Number one, this whole thing started because of police brutality. And in order for him to walk across the street for a, a photo shoot, there needed to be some mild forms of police brutality. There wasn't any knees on necks or anything like that, but peaceful protesters had flashbangs and they said there wasn't tear gas. There was some sort of gas that was being thrown at the protesters that was causing them to cough and sneeze. So there can be some sort of discrepancy on what it is. It was basically tear gas. And brutality was used to a degree for him to pose in front of a church with a Bible in his hand. And as a Christian, that was sickening for me to watch because the Bible is not supposed to be used as a prop. He was using it like he was an Instagram model, you know, promoting some sort of protein shake or, or something like that. He was posing with it with all these weird angles that I've, I've never heard, seen somebody use to hold a Bible. And I mean, that was, that was offensive. It was sickening. And when you go to a church, first of all, Christians aren't going to church right now because they're closed. That particular one was closed. When you go to a church, even if it's for a photo shoot, you might pray, give the, the nation some words to think about as you pray. He didn't pray. If you're holding a Bible, one thing you might want to do is, you know, open up the Bible and read some scripture for the cameras to, to give people some hope. He didn't do that at all. He got there. He did this offended lots of Christians, including the Archdiocese of, of the D.C. Episcopal Church. And I thought it was disgusting, absolutely disgusting to see. That's not going to help things either. Yeah, the very brief uh, amount that I was uh, looking on Twitter over the last couple of days, uh, I saw the day before, so it was the day before yesterday, that uh, the president was being criticized for not doing anything and not going out and not saying anything and not uh, getting out in front and and trying to uh, calm the public, and then yesterday he was criticized for going out there, and you know, I mean, it it, it wasn't it, it it looked very uh, it looked very much like it, it was all a setup and like what you're talking about, you know, the you know the Bible, you know, it, it didn't look it didn't it didn't look sincere, it didn't feel sincere, and you know that's one of the issues when you when you have a president when you have uh, troubled times like this, you know, you you like to have a calming effect and somebody that can come out there and and um and give a speech to to all america but man two days ago 
people didn't like it that he wasn't out there. Then he goes out there yesterday, and then he didn't make any fans there. So well, and it's not just no. hey, you're you're complaining on one side, you're complaining on the other side. Make up your mind. What do you want? I don't think anybody has an issue with the president getting up and addressing the nation. But a lot of folks had an issue with the president getting up and saying, I'm going to send troops in if these state governors and state and city mayors don't dominate the streets. And number two, um, using the Bible as a reason for a photo shoot uh, instead of using it to show I'm going to use my faith to get me through this, for instance, using this scripture. And one last thing before we go to the second chapter. Remember all those people three years ago that had an issue with Colin Kaepernick taking a knee during the anthem. They said, hey, this is not right. President Trump called him a son of a bitch. Uh, people didn't like that I was not standing up for the anthem because Trump was calling me, uh, me a son of a bitch, which is offensive to me and my mom. And, and folks were trashing me. People, folks were certainly trashing Kaepernick and saying, I wish that people like him would just express themselves in a different way. Well, guess what? He hasn't gotten a job in the NFL. Things have not changed. And people are now expressing themselves in a different way. Well, that's where you get to this part where we talked about this could be in the rearview mirror by next week. The one thing about Kaepernick, he wasn't the greatest spokesman himself where, you know, he had the pig socks and, you know, some of his history with um, uh, against the police. But, you know, his message and his protest um to have uh, the people denounce it because, uh, well, he hates the military. He hates police. And and really, I don't know how many weeks went by, but it was really corporate America was, was tired of it. Football fans, uh, football fans were saying, you know, they were tired of it. They just wanted their sports. They did not want any more protests. They did not want this where it seemed like it was going against the, uh, you know, the, the military where it was going against the police. Mm -hmm. They just wanted football. And uh, there were a lot of the owners that were in agreement with that. And they just had enough of this. And they said, go protest on your own time, not here. And, and that's the fear of this particular situation right now. You hear a lot of people that are uh, empathizing with protesters and the situation and, and the, and the heinous video and, and everything. But, uh, this time next week, are we talking about it? Are people going to be like, uh, you know what, let's move on to something else? I mean, that's that's the, uh, I think that's the one of the biggest fears. That is the fear. Yeah, and honestly, I think this would be the perfect time to sign Colin Kaepernick. I mean, you look at what the NBA did a couple of years ago. It was probably about five, six years ago now with Jason Collins. He was the first openly gay player to play in the NBA and he was he was washed up he was averaging like one point per game the year before he decided to come back and the NBA just said you know what we're gonna throw him in the league anyway because we want to have an openly gay player in the league and and that was that he barely played he wasn't any good but they had him in the league the NFL could do the same thing with Colin Kaepernick, who I think would be actually a much better player than Jason Collins was in the final year of his career people want to say he was terrible he wasn't good enough to be a backup just hey Throw him on to an NFL team, maybe the Jaguars, whomever, and just make it happen and end the blackballing. That would be a great move by the NFL. I don't think it's going to happen, though. But if the NBA could do it with Jason Collins, then the NFL could do it with Colin Kaepernick. Well, remember, teams were worried about a protest with their fans not showing up for the games. There's not going to be any fans at the game. So exactly. Go Who's going to boo Kaepernick? Nobody. <laughs> now, let's go to uh, Chapter 2 which is uh, similar to, it's, it's an extension of what we were talking about. We've had all of these protests and unrest, uh, especially over the weekend and even into last night. I mean, so, and who knows what's going to happen tonight as we're talking right now. So uh, what was your view here, uh, Brian, on the protests and the unrest? Well, I've got a lot of views on, on, the, on the protests and the unrest. And, and the first thing is, that when it comes to the peaceful protests, I support that 100%. When it comes to massive protests and disruptive protests that are peaceful, even those that are shutting down city blocks and stopping traffic on the highway, I support that to get the point across. I'm 100% against the rioting, 100% against the looting. I understand where some of it is coming from, where like I said, 
Colin Kaepernick tried to peacefully protest by putting a knee down, and everybody just ripped him. Well, not everybody, but a lot of folks ripped him to shreds, called him a son of a bitch, and said, you're not getting a football job again. But I'm 100% against the rioting and looting. Some of it appears is, is to be coming from, um, from outside the community. Some of the people are actually, according to multiple media reports, um, coming from several states away. They are, some of them are white nationalists who are getting together posing as members of Antifa or posing as members of Black Lives Matter just to make those groups look bad. But all the rioting and looting, I am 100% against. Um, just because an unarmed black man dies, is murdered, doesn't mean that you're allowed to burn down an auto zone or any other building. It doesn't mean that you're entitled to a television or a shopping spree without having to pay. One has nothing to do with the other and people are going to they're, they're going to miss the whole point of, of, of why people were protesting in the, in the beginning if they decide, well, I need to burn down this building and I need to get a television and I need to throw a rock at a, police, a policeman. One thing I really did like, and I'd like to see more of this, is um, an excellent way to reduce some of the acrimony, some of the distrust between the police and the community. It came from our very own state of Michigan, where the sheriff of the of of the of Genesee County met with protesters the other day, and here is what happened. We want to be with y'all for real. So I took my helmet off and laid the batons down. I want to make this a parade, not a protest. Come on, come on. You got little ones here. You got dogs. So what's up? So listen, I'm just telling you, these cops love you. That cop over there hugs people. So you tell us what you need to do. And there you go. You hear the crowd saying, walk with us. And he did it. And there was no drama. The, the, the people there loved it. I think I saw the same thing happening in Denver, Colorado, where the, the police chief was walking arm in arm, elbow to elbow with the protesters. That's the way you start solving some of these issues when it comes to reducing the tension and ending the looting and the rioting. Great move by those two individuals. Yeah, there's some great scenes uh, like that all across the, the country. And I thought Detroit, you know, you got to give it up at least for, for one night to the police chief and uh, also Mayor Duggan, uh, how they'd all, you know, Detroit seemed to uh, have a peaceful protest. And, you know, like you're saying, you know, 100 percent, you don't want to go out there. You're not calling for violence uh, and looting. I, I do know going all the way back, uh, I don't know, when, when uh, you know, you had uh, L.A. and yeah, the the riots uh, out of Rodney King, and a lot of the people that were you know burning L.A. and, and taking uh, that were involved in, in non or in violent protests said, look, we had to tear something up because people were not listening to us. We, we just were at wit's end. I, I mean, you get that. This this is nothing that you would ever want to condone, but you know that's that was when I saw it initially. I thought, wow, people are so upset. But like you were saying, you didn't even know some of these loosely organized. Uh, some of them pretty organized other groups going in and, mm -hmm. and, and using this situation. And there was a, uh, you know, there were a couple minutes there that I was just sitting back. It was like one of those surreal moments, like a little bit, a couple minutes on nine 11, there was uh, actually on three 11 when uh, the coronavirus hit and Rudy Gobert was uh, the, the, the official was running out to the middle of the court and you know suspending the game and then the nebraska coach of the big 10 tournament is uh is, is keeled over on the, on the bench and they're saying he has to leave for health reasons and i mean it looks like he ultimately he didn't have the coronavirus yeah. but for that like one minute i'm thinking wait a second how, you know how contagious is this a guy starts a game and he's fine and then midway through the game he's keeled over and, and have to leave, has to leave the game with, with the riots and when they're like these are not protesters of george floyd these are uh, groups that are coming in it was just like uh, uh it was you know a surreal minute or two there yeah and actually one of the things that i think could really help in addition to having the police officers uh step up and say hey we're gonna walk with you and i, I think there have been a lot of videos out there of police officers taking a knee in front of the protesters to show that they're not being aggressive is actually for the protesters to step up against 
the rioters who are pretending to be for their cause. Some of them actually are and say, hey, this is an opportunity just for me to get some stuff. And some of the protesters, um, or some of the rioters and some of the looters are not there for a TV at all. They just want to make the protesters look bad. But here's something that came from Brooklyn, New York, when some looters approached a target. Watch this video and see how the looters were, um, were greeted. Well, and as you can see right there, they were saying, you know, obviously some some uh, R-rated words there, but they were saying bleep no, and they were blocking off the target to ensure that the looters could not smash the windows, could not get in there and steal. And I think that if um, for, for those that are really taking this seriously, for those that want to make this movement look good, it is imperative for, the <laughs> for them to step up and to stop any sort of rioting, stop any sort of looting, and to tell the police that somebody is in the area trying to riot or loot to point them out and get them arrested. Yeah, I like the guy with the uh, the, the red white pole. You know, getting everybody he's ready to uh, to really guard the store there. And then a the guy that looked like he didn't need a pole. He's like a lot bigger than everybody else. Like like he was a bouncer. Nobody was gonna mess uh, with that guy. But yeah, that was a good scene. I like to see that. We've got another video in this chapter here, and this one is uh, unfortunately from Minneapolis where it is the third precinct and we see that it is burning that it is on fire we'll go to that video actually my uh my video is freezing up but we'll get to that in just a second but um actually no i think we can play it for you guys right now gathered at the front of the minneapolis third precinct we'll give you a shot from sky four you can see the front of this building is on fire we also know in the same area that the Max at Pawn Shop, which is a much bigger building, is on fire. An activist group live streaming the riot says they have taken over this building. We're not sure how taking over a building and the fire goes together, but you can see people are throwing wood and throwing things at the fire, making it continue to grow. We'll keep following this. And that, course, that took place began. on Friday night. And Dennis, when I saw that, I was, I was stunned because, you know, I mean, my first thought was, you know, how terrible is this Minneapolis the police department? I mean, obviously the rioters were wrong, but number one, you're crushing a guy's neck and killing him with three other guys watching. And number two, um, the police department was so weak that they just, according to the reports that I was watching, they just left the third precinct so that they could burn it down. Like, I, I, I get that you want to reduce the casualties, but... And, and I, I, I get that I'm against bringing in the military, but you got National Guard, you got other members of the police force, bring them in so that you don't just allow your precinct to burn down. Walking away and quitting, that's not law enforcement. Well, I mean, you have to make a quick assessment of the situation. That's the first, not just now that I saw the video, but just an hour ago, because I wasn't looking at that uh, on Friday, so I don't know much about that situation, but... We do know that's the, that was the scene, that was the city where the police officers uh, ultimately, uh, you know, murdered George Floyd. So it, if you're if you don't have the, the power, the manpower, people there to uh, to guard against and to, to save your precinct, sometimes, um, you know, I, you can see a situation where you can just say, hey, let's let's get out of here. And, and um, I, I mean, what are you going to do if you, well, you can't the, arrest everybody if you don't have the manpower? No, the, the, I, I get that. But this happened on Friday. I mean. The death of George Floyd was on Monday. You had protest Tuesday. They started really ramping up on Wednesday. Thursday was when they burned down the auto zone and the target. And so you think, all right, now these rioters are getting really dangerous. We need to step up. And I think that on Thursday night, they were trying to get closer to the precinct and they didn't get there. Uh, I mean, that, that would be the time to get every single officer available and use whatever training tactics you had that were non-lethal to prevent them from, from destroying the third precinct and everything else. And if you need the National Guard, bring them in. Uh, but, but I mean, they've the Minneapolis Police Department looks like it needs serious reform on multiple levels because you can't obviously let protesters or not protesters, but rioters just burn down buildings left and right and just quit. 
but at the same time you, you can't just say hey let's bring in tanks and predator drones well you can if it's uh to uh, to quell the violence and you're not actively you know uh you know the fanning the flames there if it's there for uh protection i think you know I, depending on how this uh ends up going you know you may have to use uh, uh at least have that type of uh, uh backing but in a, in a non-violent way but is that going to make things uh escalate uh, i'm not an expert on that but well, and, and, to your point there like if if you had those type of uh if you had that type of personnel and it was uh outside the third precinct there maybe you would not have the people uh you know burning it down and if we had some of those police officers doing what the sheriff in flint did if we had the other three officers being arrested if the governor of Minnesota was actively working with the legislature and the same thing in D.C. to start passing laws to make sure this stuff never happened again, we wouldn't have gotten to this point. But we still don't have, as far as I know, any meaningful laws in the last week passed to prevent this stuff from happening in the future. So, Yeah, I mean, so there are already, uh, you know, protocols and, and laws and, and rules. I mean, that that uh, 99 percent of the police officers or how many, whatever percentage you want to put on there, abide by them. So coming out this week and saying yes you know like there, there's already uh rules and protocol not to the, 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 there's there, there's no there's no protocol to you know put your knee on somebody when they're already being uh apprehended and you know and snuffing their life out i mean that that's already like, like that's on the books like so i mean that coming up and, and putting something over the top there and saying yes uh well, you can't specifically do this i mean well I, I think it's more than that i think it's about accountability so that when that happens you won't have the situation that happened in new york where his buddies uh that are in a different department look at that and say hey we can't have one of our blues go down even though what was done was clearly murder let's just sweep it under the rug let's give him a desk job let's fire him and give him no pension when if it was anybody else they'd be going to prison i think that's the kind of reform that people are, are looking for yeah well i mean you have to you would think that they would speed up this process but like for these other police officers and, and, and get some charges here forthcoming. I mean, they have to go through their, you know, this, uh, this process that they, they talk about, but you know, it's been uh, a week and a day now. So mm -hmm. I, that seems like it's enough time. Yeah. We appreciate everybody that's uh, sending in your feedback on the live stream on the side. We'll get to that in just a second, uh, but let's uh, now turn the page to the third chapter. And in the third chapter, we get to a little bit of sports, because we've been talking about this seemingly every show, Major League Baseball versus the Players Association to try to become the first sport to return. And um, on Sunday, and I'll put uh, this article from ESPN up on the screen from you or for you, we saw the players' first proposal, and it said that, they, that their proposal included a 114-game season, deferred salaries in, event, in the event of a canceled postseason, and the option for all players to opt out of a potential 2020 season due to coronavirus concerns. And, of course, the owner's proposal was um, an 82-game season, uh, not a 114-game season. Also, it says that... Um, uh, the players expect the league to reject it. And it says that the union's proposal would run from June 30th to October 31st. So we'd be playing regular season games through Halloween. And the union remains steadfast that players should receive their full prorated salaries. So, Dennis, what do you think about this offer from the players, not an 82 game season, 114 game season, and we'd be playing regular season games through Halloween. Well, at least we have something to negotiate with. Before, it seemed like it was just becoming a stalemate, like uh, Max Scherzer, others throwing out, like, we're just going to play hardball here. There's no way that we're accepting, you know, less money than what we agreed to earlier, and it just seemed like it wasn't going anywhere. So at least, um, at least baseball came out now uh, a 50 game season, just 30 percent of the the season, you know, to me is, uh, you know, pretty wild. But oh yeah, and I can put I can put some of the details of that up on the screens for everybody as well, uh, because 
this this wasn't officially an offer back to the players but according to i guess espn sources their last ditch effort would be to implement a schedule of around 50 games that would start in july and it also says that um it would it would give the players a fully prorated salary but of course if you look at a 114 game schedule prorated salary would give them 70 plus percent of their original salaries a 50 game schedule would only give them 30.8 percent of their salary for the season yeah well when you take 114 games and then you take the 50 that uh that baseball proposed and you kind of say okay let's meet in the middle there it ends up being 82 games which is the original one that they were talking about uh i got to give it to jeff passon who right when this was uh, talked about probably a month ago said look what needs to happen here is major league baseball has got to defer some of this money uh, in the future to the the players where they get their prorated salary and they get some deferred money if there's a you know if there ends up being a baseball and an expanded playoffs and all of that works and there isn't a second wave where you know they'll get some money on the back end and I think that's what it's going to come down to. But I'll tell you this, chap, we've already talked about that. For me, I thought it's a responsibility for baseball, July 4th, with everything that the country has gone through with COVID. Now you have the situation with George Floyd and Minneapolis. With baseball, if they could get back, we've seen agitators in sports. Uh, you go back to 9-11. You remember uh, George Bush uh, in New York throwing out the first pitch. Mm-hmm. You can think of Katrina with the Saints. And and, and um, what that meant to community, what that meant to the community, uh, having baseball come back uh, amidst the you know civil unrest and what the players could do, you know, for this country, uh, whether however they would go through it, and you know they however they could be spokespeople for spokespersons for this, they could do that, and you would have this combination. Now it becomes uh, imperative, you know, that they get out there. And, and put their differences aside to make sure that they have baseball. And I'm glad that you brought up the first pitch and, and what George Bush did after to, uh, 2001 because there's there's something special about a first pitch that you don't really have in other sports. They, I mean, in basketball, they have somebody bring the basketball out to give it to the referee. Nobody looks forward to that. In hockey, you know, to to a point, you have some uh, you have a celebrity that might come out and drop the puck. But the first ceremonial th- puck drop, yeah, e- exactly. And in football, there really isn't. I mean, I guess somebody can come out for the coin toss. But with baseball, it's different. And I think that with the return of baseball, you could have, you know, for for opening day, a coronavirus survivor throw out the first pitch. You could have in Minnesota or in Texas, where George Floyd was born and raised, you could have someone from the Floyd family throw out a first pitch. And I think that that could go a long way to to helping our nation heal, or at least not a long way, because I don't know any of these things go a long way, but it could go a small step in terms of helping the nation heal. Hey, but I will when, say this when, about the... No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say Christian Stewart smacks five home runs in the first week. You know, he could stand up there, and he's getting interviewed after the game, and he could give his thoughts, and, you know, uh, Jacoby Jones could be standing next to him. These guys could have their arms around each other. They could be talking about uh, reform and and uh you know how they're feeling and 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 that that would be huge rather than having no baseball everybody's just trashing these guys yeah i mean they have a real like before last week they had a gigantic opportunity to help heal the country now it's uh twice as much so you know let's see that happen yeah well when i look at these two deals or, or these two potential offers a 114 game schedule and a 50 game schedule i I mean i think they're both a joke because the first plan that's put together by the players 114 games i think is okay if you can schedule a double header or two a week which actually would be possible given that you're going to have a 30-man roster and and an extra 20 men on the taxi squad so i think that would be possible but when you talk about finishing the regular season in hollow on halloween that's laughable when you talk about doing that and then having a full playoff after that we'd have world series games being played in thank uh, on thanksgiving or after thanksgiving if the twins or the yankees make the world series and they're playing let's say the phillies we could have snow for four five six or seven games of the world series and then you look at the the potential 
counter offer by the owners is a last ditch effort of 50 games. That doesn't make sense because you're playing less than a third of a season, meaning the players are going to get less than a third of their money. I mean, it's June 2nd. I yeah, think they're it's not gonna way like too that. early to be talking about let's play less than a third of the season. These clowns have put together their laughable proposals. Now it's time to get serious over the next few days and hammer out a deal because if they don't get a deal done in a week, if we're sitting here on June 9th, a week from today, and there's no deal, then on July 4th, you're not going to have your dream. I'm not going to have my dream of kicking back and watching baseball on Independence Day. Well, at least they've got something to negotiate now, and you're right. Usually it comes down where it doesn't look like there's going to anything that's going to happen, and then it ends up happening. Uh, so I'm still in the camp that I think it is going to happen. Some of the feedback, this one coming in from Jacob, who answers the question on baseball. He says, uh, I would say we should have a 114-game season as opposed to the 50-gamer so that baseball fans have more time to actually watch baseball this summer. Uh, I'm with you on that. Meanwhile, uh, Reno is asking, where's the beard? Oh, and I think he's uh, talking about you. Yeah, well, that's right, because you still have yours, Jeff. I'm looking at it. Yeah. Nobody's commented in on that jersey yet behind you. I, I'm, I was waiting for that uh, myself. Oh, now It's that got you a mind it, of its own. It keeps yeah. on blowing. Now that it's turned, I, I, I see it a little bit. I couldn't tell what it was before. Yeah, yeah that's, I mean, that's I, my high I school was, baseball jersey. Oh, I thought it said Cabrera. No, no. The blue one says Chapman. The white one is a Penn State football jersey. Oh, okay. Well, it's a good thing that you said something. You know what? Uh, I, I thought, you know, turning the turning the chapter, turning the page like we do here on this show, I thought, um, you know, hey, clean shave. Let's go after it and see what happens here. Um, but it'll grow back and get it going. See yeah, what obviously people think. the people are missing the beard. <laughs> and people are missing the beard. I got a big surprise coming up uh, during the uh, the fifth chapter that I've been teasing for a while. So yeah. I will get to that. Anything else on baseball? Well, yeah. One of the things I was thinking about, um, especially with what we're going to be talking about in the fifth chapter, which is uh, Governor Whitmer liberating the state of Michigan. Uh, there are all these other states that are liberating. And one of the things that, that Governor Whitmer did was she allowed for groups of up to 100 to meet together. And as we continue to see these numbers go down, um, I wonder if the health experts will say it's okay to allow fans in games. Now, I'm not saying 50% capacity like they're having in restaurants or even 25%. But what if, in, in a way to help out the fans, in a way to not need crowd noise, and in a way to help out the owners to at least get some sort of money, they say, you know what? We're going to use extreme social distancing and we'll allow up to 3,000 fans per game. Now, obviously, that would vary state by state because each state's going to have a different rule. But, I mean, if you have 3,000 fans at a game and every single stadium has over 30,000 uh, seats, a lot of them over 40,000, you're talking about less than 10% capacity at every major league stadium. I'm not an expert, but that sounds reasonable. I mean, we've watched the last couple of years of Tigers baseball where there's 15,000 fans or less, and it looked like everybody was unintentionally socially distancing because nobody wanted to go to these games. And so if you go from 20% capacity or whatever, or 15% capacity to 3,000 fans a game, they're, they're, they're 40 bucks a ticket, that's $120,000 a year or a game for these owners. Um, you, you add in food and drinks, you know, they might not be, they might not lose as much money as they think if the health experts say it's okay to allow at least some fans to go into games. Yeah, well, I'm ready for that. You know, first things first, let's get a game out there. But, yeah. you know, Miami, uh, the Miami Dolphins have, uh, they put out a couple uh, projections and a couple models of uh, what they're going to do in the fall when the Dolphins play. I mean, they're they're putting it out there and they've talked about, you know, staggering people when they arrive and and like you would at a at, at a wedding, uh, dismissing the rows uh, or church, you know, dismissing the rows uh, one by one in, in different ways. I don't know. I guess you could figure something out if you need to use the restrooms or something. But yeah, I think that. Um, I mean, if we continue to have uh, positivity here, uh, there'd be a chance maybe for some fans to go to the games. That would be great. Yeah, that yeah, would. It would uh, be. All right, let's turn the chapter now to, or turn the page now to the fourth chapter. Ooh, and this is where I take center stage. Now, 
you know what? Last time it came to game time, I uh, I threw you a curveball, and instead of going with a game that we had planned, I came up with five trivia questions, and I said, you know, if you didn't get any, you're going to be banned from your own show. You're going to get four. You're going to be ridiculed all the time. Three was, you know, average, and you know, you made it. And that was that was good. And four was very impressive. And five, of course, spoke for itself. And you got all five, so I'm impressed. Yes. So uh, today, the the um, thing I'm going to be looking for is I need the team that this Detroit team did it again. So I'm not looking for the Detroit team. I'm looking for the opponent. And I will give you a situation, and you just tell me who the opponent was. How does that sound? Okay, fair enough. We'll see how I can do. I'm calling it did it against. All right. Did it against, okay. Justin Verlander, in his first no-hitter as a Detroit Tiger, did it against the Brewers. His second no-hitter, I remember it very well because the uh, Kentucky Derby was running that same day. Justin Verlander recorded his second no-hitter versus this team. The Toronto Blue Jays. You are correct. And, and I'm glad that you gave me the first one because I thought you were going to ask me who he had his first no-hitter against, and I was going to guess the Blue Jays. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so that hit helped me out a lot. All right. Well, I've toughened these up a little bit, and I'm going to go to baseball history here. I know this is before your time, so let's see. With a season less than a week old in 1984, big year for the Tigers, year I was born. Jack Morris threw a no-hitter against this team. (laughs) You may look at this famous video of of Morris. You can see he he ends up getting a strikeout for the final out there. You can see Lance Parrish jumping up, you know, then grabbing Jack Morris. Who did he do it against? Hey, you've got a a one in, uh, you know what, uh, 29 shot, right? Well, I I know it was an American League team, and... um, I know what, that you're down to one in 14. Yeah, yeah there I know you go. it wasn't the Tampa Bay Rays. No, you're right. One in 13. You got a shot here. Uh, the Astros were still in the National League. True. Although I believe the Brewers were in the American League at that time. That's I, right. Ben Ogilvy and company. Gorman Thomas. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess. And that back then it was just the East and the West. There was no Central Division. I'm going, That's also true. Yeah, I'm going to guess the division rival at the time, Boston Red Sox. That is incorrect. It was the White Sox. But you got the Sox part right, so I feel like I should give you a half credit, but no, that's no not working credit. that way. All right, so first one you got wrong, so uh, yeah. not just today, but in the two times you did this. Uh, all right, Miguel Cabrera won the Triple Crown in 2012. He went 0 for 2 against this team in the final game of the regular season to clinch the crown. Biggie left to a standing ovation by this team's fans. Um, Ooh, he doesn't know it. All right, the, think the, it the through. The Minnesota Twins. Incorrect. Everybody watching? Everybody got a guess there? Look at it. I like it. Hey, look at uh, John knew that it was the White Sox. <laughs> <laughs> we two in a row with the White Sox? <laughs> no, no. Uh, John knew that it was the White Sox uh, previous. No, it was the, uh, it was oh. the Kansas City Royals. Oh. I knew it was a division rival. Dang. Tigers' last playoff series was against this team. Oh, that's easy. Brad Ausmus screwed everything up against the Baltimore Orioles. They got swept. What a joke. You're, you're, you're correct. Yes. You are correct about that. that. Easy. All right, that is the uh, the fourth one. I'm two and, and two. I'm just trying to say so these are all pretty easy. So let me give you a tough one. Hmm. Ten years ago today. Okay. Armando Galarraga had his infamous perfect game snapped by Jim Joyce against this team when he could not get the final out. Cabrera throwing to Galarraga, covering first base, foot was on the bag, but this team was able to beat out the throw even though he was out and later they would have replay and he would have had his perfect game, but he did not have his perfect game. What team was it against? It was the Cleveland Indians. Of course, it was a team from Ohio. And Jim Joyce is from the state of Ohio. Huh. Mm-hmm. I wonder why he would want to screw over a team from Michigan. 
really think Jim Joyce uh, wanted to screw over a team from Michigan? Let's let's take off his shirt and see if he's got a Buckeye tattoo. <laughs> well, you'd be uh, you'd be fun at a Michigan party going over the 2016 uh, referees of that game with JT Barrett and everything. Remember that one? Hey, hey, they they helped out my Nittany Lions. I'll take that. Yeah, well, you get did to a the good... Big Ten championship game. So you three did for, a three for yeah, five. Three for five. Three for five is a, is a nice job. You, you did it. Yeah. Pretty good job. All right, that gets us uh, gets us to the uh, the fifth chapter, and we've got five minutes here and five glorious minutes where, uh, Chap, we we've got the uh, the governor is relaxing uh, more. She's as you put it, liberating Michigan. That's right. And um, here is actually a report from Channel Four News from uh, just yesterday when she announced that she was going to be liberating the state of Michigan. Today I signed an executive order moving the entire state of Michigan to phase four of the My Safe Start plan. I've also rescinded the Safer at Home order. It's the news most of Michigan's waited to hear for a couple of months now. Effective immediately, groups of 100 or less can gather outdoors if they can maintain strict social distancing. The indoor rules still say 10 or fewer. On Thursday, June 4th, retailers can reopen to customers without an appointment. Previously, they can only take customers with that appointment. Come Monday, June 8th, the following is allowed. Outdoor fitness classes, athletic practices, training sessions and games. Although coaches, spectators, and participants not from the same household have to maintain six-foot distancing at all times. Public pools can now open. In-home services such as house cleaning are now allowed. Also on June 8th, office work not able to be performed at home can resume, although the preference is to still have work from home wherever possible. Drive-in movie theaters can start operating. Libraries, museums, and parks will also be able to open. The governor happy with this next step, but she does warn. But the data has and, shown and that we're ready to carefully move our state. The one thing that they did not mention state. right there in the Channel 4 report was that uh, beginning on Monday, June 8th, we'll also be able to go to restaurants and bars at a 50% capacity. Dennis, what do you think about Michigan being liberated? You can, you're free to roam around now. And are you going to be, how soon is it going to be before you and your family go out to eat? Are you going to be lining up outside on Monday? Uh, no, we won't. But, uh, you know, the graph that was uh, up behind the governor there, that this has been a tough three months out in Michigan, she's right about that. You know, we have somebody in our house who is uh, in the high risk category. So we are going to be taking a very cautious uh, approach and we're going to be protecting uh, ourselves. And so we're going to have to wait and see how it works out. But um, it, 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 they are proceeding safely here. Uh, it seems like, and, and uh, hopefully, you know, that people are able to get out there and, and have fun and, and go to restaurants and enjoy themselves and, you know, and, and put a smile on their face. And, you know, we can get through the get through the last of spring here and, and maybe get into to summer even with less restrictions. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's the goal. That's what I'm hoping for. But, no, I, I'm, we have to be cautious, uh, you know, here in the Fithian household. Yeah, I'm, I don't really have to be cautious because I'm I'm single. I am 35 years old. I'm I'm healthy and all that stuff. Uh, but I'm not going to be running out at any point next week or probably any point this month to a restaurant just because the experience is going to be so much different. Um, you know, 50 percent capacity. Uh, half the tables are going to be empty. You got to wear a mask. To, just to get inside and, and things like that. That's not what I'm used to when it comes to a restaurant experience. And when I think about a sports bar, if I were to go to watch like the first Tigers game, or I was, if I were to go to watch a UFC event or an NBA playoff game or something like that, I mean, you, who wants to go to a half empty bar where people are going to look at you kind of weird if you high five the guy next to you when Matt Boyd strikes out the side in the seventh inning? That that would be kind of strange. But in terms of if it's a good idea to open things up, I mean, look, the, the health experts were saying that these other states, Georgia and some in the south, were, were crazy and there was going to be a, a massive spike. We haven't seen that. Um, it, it seems like it might be OK to to open things up. So and, and on top of that, I haven't heard any of the scientists and experts screaming lately about, hey, this is crazy. They shouldn't be opening up. So if they've been calming down, they they haven't been saying much, then maybe it's OK to liberate Michigan. 
Yeah, it'd be strange to see Matt Boyd strike it out uh, the side of the seventh. That would be sweet, you know. For but Tiger that'd fans. be a reason to high five the guy at the table next to me. It would. I don't think we're gonna have. I don't think it's. I think uh, as we come out of this, I don't think we're gonna be high fiving people. Yeah. You know, like we used to. I think that's gonna be uh, days of old. Just like uh, you know, post nine eleven, you had to take your shoes off and go through the you know high security at the airports. I don't think you're gonna see as many handshakes and high fives and hugs. Yeah, and you know, I, did put up, I, I did put up a poll on Twitter for. I voted. Uh, I voted on your poll. You did, and um, the poll was about Big Gretch announcing that bars and restaurants are going to be at fifty percent capacity. Uh, when do you plan to go to a bar? And forty-one point two percent, which was the largest number, said, "Who knows? No rush for me." Thirty-six point seven percent said that they're going to go on June eighth the day that they're allowed to go 8.5 percent so that they're going to wait until next weekend and 13.6 percent said that they're going to wait another month to go so thank you for all those that uh, voted yeah i was at uh, number four john says good job guys wish the show was even longer he says i worry we're opening things up too quickly and we're going to see a spike in cases without a vaccine it's just inevitable that the virus is going to continue uh, that is uh, from uh, John, but then he says Keith. So I don't know. Uh, Keith or John, whatever Maybe that's it is. his middle name. It could be. We appreciate the feedback. You know, I, 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 it was in the first chapter where we were talking about uh, the country is hurting and people wanted to talk about my beard. And then I, we got into the baseball and then, you know, we had people that were talking about you know, the situation in our country. So I got to do a better job at uh, making sure I'm, I'm hitting where the, the feedback is at mm-hmm. when it comes uh, to something relevant. Did you want to get to one of the, one or two of those before we get, end the show? Uh, I think I've read them all. Okay. All right. Yeah. I went through all of, uh, I went through all of those, uh, except here's uh, one for me. No, I didn't read. He said the video of George Floyd's uh, death was one of the most horrifying things that I've ever seen. I pray that his family uh, gets the resolve they deserve. Come on, America. Let's be better. Yeah, let's good. do it. It's a good uh, thought there and a good feedback there from Reno. Well, my big surprise is I was waiting till June. I wanted to uh, bring back the 50 and uh, 50 where uh, I, I want to drop 50 pounds. Oh. But and the good part here, chap, is that I'm not going to inundate people with my, my weight loss, but I am, I am launching here on June 2nd, and I'm putting together a – it's going to be over six months – where if I'm dropping uh, eight pounds a month, it'll get very close to what December, where I'll be able to get to my goal. And so then every uh, every month, so my next re- update will be on uh, July second, and uh, I'll I'll tell everybody where I was, and then I'll tell everybody where I'm at, and then maybe at that point we can get some people to to come on along, and if they see the progress, they'll be like, all right. All right, what's fifting and doing? I had success last year. I feel good about uh, coming back from everything that I learned and making it stick this time. Yeah, let's encourage Dennis to hit that 50 and 50, drop those 50 pounds, and maybe do it early. No need to wait until December. If he can do it early, then he can do it early. Yeah, yeah, I'm all right for doing it early here. And the one thing, you know, when when you're on radio, it's like how many people see you? You know, they might see you walking in and out of the studio, but, you know, two times a week I'm here on the video, and then I'm shooting videos, I'm like, uh, it, you know, there, there's some motivation. There's motivation everywhere you look, but there's just an added uh, piece of, of motivation. And also, coming up on Thursday, U Sports. We're going to have Eddie this summer. We'll talk about where it is at. U Sports here, not just in Michigan, but across the country. We will get to that on Thursday's fifth chapter. And Dennis, I know that you tease that for, you tease your 50 and 50 for several weeks at a time. I've got a tease for you. I've got a surprise coming up for you and the listeners on June 11th. So that's going to be next Thursday. Stay tuned for that. I will. I can't wait. Nice tease, chap. That's right. So long, everybody. We will talk to you on Thursday. Thanks for watching. I don't know why I'm yelling. Thanks.
he represents the myth By way of Penn State when Chapman gets to talk in sports The people can't wait, he represents the myth Being true, EMU will cut Dennis in the fall And his veins bleeding blue, they got respect around his face When that light turns red, so don't sleep on these dudes Just invite your friends to cut your nap short And tip your cap for, and sit back for But the chapter, huh. Brian Chapman Dennis Pithian, when they open their mouths It's fitting the facts, bruh, this ain't even optional, man You just have to tune into YouTube to watch the broadcast Or download it to your phone to peep the podcast They mix laughter, they get after, it's all